In the Nag Hammadi scriptures is contained a Sethian Gnostic treatise entitled Marsanis. Named after a Syrian prophet mystic, it is believed to be dated to the 4th century and was originally composed in Greek and later translated into Coptic. In his work entitled Panarion, Epiphanius of Salamis speaks of the Archontics and, quote, a certain Martiades and Marcianos who had been snatched up into the heavens and had come down after three days. It is now considered established fact that the name Marcianos does in fact refer to the Marsanis of whom this treatise is dedicated. What makes this a particularly interesting text is that it describes Marsanis' visionary ascent to the highest intelligible realms and incorporates elements of theurgy, astrology, arithmology, as well as theories of language that aid in the theurgic ascent. We can easily trace the influences of Iamblichus's pupil Theodore of Assin, and as it is in conformity with Iamblichus's thought, this Marsani's text is one of the rare surviving materials that prove the exception to the rule with regard to the criticisms leveled against Gnostics as world-denying heretics. In fact, this treatise implies that it is through the power of human perception and sensation that we can ultimately contemplate the higher realms through a mutual identification with the divine, embracing all levels of reality. This video will attempt to draw direct parallels between a section of the text describing the triple-powered one, at least those that have survived in intelligible fragments, and the three moments of the Iamblichian one. Marsanis' visionary ascent and Iamblichus' system do not align perfectly, and their terminology differs. It is difficult to determine exactly how the two systems correspond, but hopefully this video will help shed an intuitive light into this mystery. In Neoplatonic thought, metalipsis, or participation, is defined as, quote, the engagement of ontologically inferior beings with their ontological superiors. It is important to note that the source of something does not contain that something within itself. The source actually transcends or goes beyond it. It is in a way outside it. Even though the qualities of the posterior thing can approach or align more closely with the anterior principle, it has a being that is fundamentally distinct from it, and hence also inferior. However, anything that exists, let's say a human being, that is ontologically posterior to a source, let's say God, must out of necessity participate in that source to varying degrees. If it does not participate in its source, then that implies that it is identical with it, and therefore no longer needs to approach it. It would after all not be inferior to it in any way, and would in fact be it. In a way, a posterior thing ontologically is in some way deficient from the source from which it emanated. The one, for example, is essentially beyond everything. Hence, nothing can be said of it. In the Gnostic text, the first section is entitled Marsanis inquires about the Ionic realm of the triple-powered one. And it introduces the questions that you and I would share with Marsanis in regard to the powers that be. Quote, But beyond all these, I am seeking the kingdom of the triple-powered one, which has no beginning. Whence did he appear and act to fill the entire place of his power? In what way did the ungenerated ones come into existence without being generated? What are the differences among the ions? And how many ungenerated ones are there? In what respect do they differ from each other? These are all very good questions. Let's see if we can explore the parallels of Iamblichian theurgy and overlay their frameworks to see if we can locate where Masanis had ascended to. To clarify the Gnostic framework in which we are ascending, we can make reference to another Nag Hammadi treatise called Zostrianos and Alogonis. Between these texts, 
13 seals are outlined. Each seal or level of being is outlined, but only the last few will concern us here, since this is the realm of the highest. Seal 10 is the Barbello Aion. Seal 11 is the Triple Powered One. Seal 12 is the Invisible Spirit. And Seal 13, the ultimate seal, is the Unknown Silent One. This section is titled, The Triple Powered One Actualizes the Silence of the Unknown Silent One. When I had inquired about these things, I perceived that the Triple Powered One acted from silence. He exists prior to those that truly exist, that belong to the realm of being. The Triple Powered One is a pre-existent otherness belonging to the invisible spirit that actualizes the Silent One. In the silence of the Triple Powered One, who follows the invisible spirit acts. For so long as the invisible spirit acts, the Triple Powered One acts also. The silence that belongs to the unbegotten, invisible spirit is among the ions, and from the beginning he is insubstantial. But the activity of the invisible spirit is the triple-powered one. The unbegotten, invisible spirit is prior to the ion of Barbello, since he is insubstantial. Now, as for the summit of the silent one's silence, it is possible for the invisible spirit, the summit of the triple powered one's activity, to behold it. And the unknown silent one who exists, who is silent, who is beyond insubstantiality, manifested the triple powered, first perfect one. So what is the silent one? The silent one is the ineffable one. That is the source of all things the unparticipated, the amethectos, the self-sufficient one that does not participate with anything posterior to it, because it is beyond all and everything. It is the culmination or origin, depending on which direction you're traveling, of the noetic realm. As you descend from the silent one through all levels of the noetic realm, you arrive eventually at the noeric realm, which is the realm of the intellect where exists the ideas, or forms, or idos. And, as all levels of being have a mediator, the noetic noeric realm is the bridge between these two realms. This encompasses the principle of life, not yet life as we experience it, as well as the associated gods who dwell at this noetic noeric level. This is not to be confused, of course, with Zeus and the Olympian deities, as we come to understand them in mythology, as we are all beyond that realm at this point. So these are an ontologically higher level of gods. Let us move back up to the noetic realm that transcends the noeric, and observe that there are three moments that are not really moments, because they all exist simultaneously, eternally, and exist beyond being, therefore existing beyond thought and differentiation. You cannot say that we are speaking of God or Allah or Yahweh because the triadic one is beyond all designation and attribution. All we can truly say about this realm of the three in the one is that it exists. It seems that Marsani is, is speaking of the desire to reach the ineffable one the unparticipated one. But in order to do so, he must travel through the instantiations of the triadic one, and posterior to the ineffable, unparticipated one is what is known as the participated one, the metakomenos, also called the simply one, which is the source of life. The source of that life that exists as a hypostasis in the noeric realm. This is the second instantiation of the Noetic One, which is also the last one before the emergence of what is known as the Protos Diados, the duality that emerges due to the fact that the Simply One is also the creative principle. The One has ceased to be passive and self-sufficient, and then begins its dynamis, its activity, and in order to create something, a division, of course, is necessary. 
In all metaphysical and religious expressions dating back to the most ancient of civilizations, there is a primordial realization that a sacrifice has to be made before a creative act can emerge. There has to be a destruction and a break in the stillness of reality for there to be anything at all to come into being. The dyad emerges in between the simply one and the one being. As the instantiation of differentiation, the dyad unites the singularity with the multiplicity, the one with the many, the limited with the unlimited, and at this point, the phenomena of number emerges. I believe the simply one is also the realm in which the invisible spirit originates, which is around seal 12. Descending and ascending from the second and third moments of the Noetic One, right before being itself emerges. The third instantiation of the Noetic One is the One Being, the Do En Or. This third moment occurs just prior to being, and hence it is the essence of being. All being emerges from the One Marsani states that he saw, quote, the first power, and the silent one, and the triple powered one, and the one that does not have breath. There is some uncertainty with regard to this breathless one. This breathless one may actually have to do with a similar construction of ineffability like the Sanskrit Om, but in this case, substituting for it Greek letters, N which represent the inarticulate aspirations of breath. The editorial notes describe this expression using geometrical metaphors as you move from the H to the N, you are moving from monad to dyad, eventually to triad. So the H is an unpronounceable aspiration representing characters by a dimensionless point in later Greek writing known as a rough breathing mark. For the second letter, we have a pronounceable vowel, e, whose one dimensional outer arc symbolizes its, its own reversion upon itself. And thirdly, a final consonant, n, symbolizing its intelligibility, the noeton, by means of the intersecting lines of the N that define a two-dimensional triadic surface. In a way, this seems to echo the Egyptian cosmology, where the god Shu, as the breath of noetic life, or Atum's light and spirit, emerges from the primordial waters of Nun. As Ustavinis states, this life is, quote, diffused at different ontological levels of reality. He exists in the transcendent realm, but also touches down to the material world and functions, quote, to make firm his flesh every day, to enliven all creatures through his mouth, putting life in their nostrils. As Ustavinis continues, the initiate identifies himself with Shu, in his animating and life-giving aspect. Shu's sister Tefnut stands for the archetypal intelligence, order, truth, and justice, the right measure for the life's emanation. So going back to our own text, the activity of the invisible spirit spoken of by Masanis is in fact the triple-powered one, which amounts to saying, that the triple-powered one's activity culminates in the invisible spirit, which transcends it. The second power is the triple-powered one itself, which brings about the third power, which is the Barbello Ion, also known as the male virgin. Here is the excerpt from the section entitled, The Barbello Ion Reveals Itself as the Triple-Powered One's Third Power. When the third power of the triple-powered one contemplated him, it said to me, Be silent, lest you should know and flee and come before me. But know that this one was silent and concentrate on understanding. 
The next section, Marsanis explains the Barbello Ion's deployment from the invisible spirit. Quote, For this reason, the virgin became male because she had separated from the male. The knowledge stood outside of him as if belonging to him. In a way, through differentiation from the male invisible spirit, the female Barbello Ion separates and becomes undifferentiated dynamis. And once she becomes actualized and differentiated again as a separate independent state, she then reattains a masculine determined status as the noose. Finally, we have arrived at Iamblichus's noeric realm of the intellect, also encompassing the noose. The unfolding of the triple powered one emerged from the dynamic activity in the intermediary realm of the noetic noeric flux. Later in the text, Marsanis receives the energia of the third power of the Barbello Ion who speaks to his followers through him as through a vessel. The Barbello has come to embody self-knowledge. The Barbello speaks directly through Marsanis. O oh, inhabitants of these places, it is necessary for you to contemplate those that are higher than these and tell them to the powers, for you will become better than the elect in the last times. Upwards mounts the invisible spirit, and you yourselves ascend upward with him, since you have the great radiant crown. But on that day you will see as you haste to ascend above with him, and even the sense perceptible things that are visible to you, and they, the intellectual. He exists eternally without substance in the one who is, who is silent, the one who is from the beginning, who is without substance. Unfortunately, you can see here that the section exists only in a fragmentary state. As we carry on through the text, and after Marsanis has seen the Supreme Deity, there is a discussion of the powers of the zodiacal signs along with an exposition on the vowels and their articulations that reflect the soul's theurgic ascent. Hopefully this video helped introduce some Iamblichian Neoplatonic thought while tentatively exploring some of the Gnostic parallels expressed through Marsanis' theurgic visionary journey. By conducting theurgic rites as well as contemplative exercises, the soul's inverted and self-alienated nature can be overcome by discovering the divine aspects of the world of generation. Remember, even though matter and the material world seem to be in a state of temporality where all things come and go, the panthere of Heraclitus, it emerges ultimately from the one and therefore also participates in the eternal. Take care for now.